we're going to talk about step four. We, uh, we talked about step one on Monday. We looked at the powerlessness in step one and talked about how it's related to the physical allergy. And we talked about the unmanageability in step one and how that's related to the mental obsession, that thing that keeps me drinking and using whether I want to or not. Then we look, took a look at step two, where I'm coming to believe that a power greater than myself can remove that mental obsession and restore me to sanity so that I can stay sober without struggling. We asked those three simple questions. Am I currently experiencing the mental obsession? And if I'm not, did anything I ever do make that go away? And if nothing I ever did made it go away besides getting high and it's gone, am I willing to give credit to a higher power for the fact that it's gone? We talked about your willingness to come here, creating a space for a higher power to already start acting in your life. Just the willingness to try something new. And then we looked at step three, turning my will and my life, my thoughts and my actions over to the care of this power. And I'm making that decision, and the first real action based on that decision is step four. Took a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. In the big book at the bottom of page 63, it says, next we launched out on a course of vigorous action, the first step of which is a personal house cleaning, which many of us have never attempted. Although our decision, the third step, was a vital and crucial step, it could have little permanent effect unless it once followed by a strenuous effort to face and be rid of the things in ourselves which have been blocking us. Our liquor was but a symptom, so we had to get down to causes and conditions. So what that's telling me is I can decide to turn my will and my life over to the care of God all I want. But unless I do some, some serious inventory work to look at all the ways that I don't do that already, I'm just going to keep doing what I always do and stay disconnected and end up struggling with my addiction indefinitely. I also like it says our liquor was but a symptom. I thought drugs and alcohol were my problem. But really they were, the, they were an attempt to solve my problem. You know, the good news is you never have to drink or use again. The bad news is that's not really the problem. We're going to have to solve the spiritual issue that drives the problem. Then the book says, therefore, we started on a personal inventory. This was step four. A business which takes no regular inventory usually goes broke. Taking a commercial inventory is a fact-finding and fact-facing process. It's an effort to discover the truth about the stock and trade. One object is to disclose damaged or unsaleable goods to get rid of them promptly and without regret. If the owner of the business is to be successful, he cannot fool himself about values. I like the business analogy because it drives home the idea that this is an inventory, not a torturous, painful, emotional process. I don't care what people say, it doesn't have to be that. And in, the word inventory just means a complete list of something. It doesn't mean having an opinion about the list. And as we go through this, I'm going to show you why people have a bad time doing their four step and how to approach it in a way that eliminates that problem and allows it to be a useful tool. He goes on to say, we did exactly the same thing with our lives. We took stock honestly. First we searched out the flaws in our makeup which had caused our failure. Being convinced itself, manifested in various ways was what had defeated us, we considered its common manifestations. And it says resentment is the number one offender. It destroys more alcoholics than anything else. From it stem all forms of spiritual disease, for we've been not only mentally and physically ill, we have been spiritually sick. When the spiritual malady is overcome, we straighten out mentally and physically. So I want to talk about the word resentment, because most of us, when we hear it, and the way the book talks about it, it sounds like it just means anger. But if you break the word down, the re at the beginning means again. You put re on a word, it means again. And the Latin root of the sentiment part of the word is sentare, which means experience or feel. So a resentment is re-experiencing or re-feeling any old negative emotion. It's having an emotional response right now to things that aren't happening right now. Not just anger. It can be sadness. It can be grief. It can be self-pity. It can be hurt feelings. It can be anything. So I didn't think I had that much anger, but I had lots of stuff in my past that when I looked at it, it didn't feel good to think about it. So there was way more to look at than I originally thought. So this is the worksheet that we use here. There's a million different versions of fourth step worksheets running around. 
one of the most well-respected treatment centers in this country, it gives out a 29-page workbook to do your fourth step in. It's insanely thorough, and yet it completely and utterly fails to teach you to do inventory. This five-column thing here, this is inventory. If I'm doing a bunch of inventory, it's a fourth step. If I'm writing about one thing that just upset me, it's a tenth step. But the process is the same, and I need to know how to do it if I want to stay sober and happy. I'm not pretending this is the right one and everyone else is wrong. This is right out of the big book, and it's incredibly simple. And simple is necessary for a guy like me, and I'm guessing for a lot of you guys too. Complicated tools are easily confused. This is very simple and very effective at doing what, it's, what it needs to do. So the thing I just read, well, there are things I love about this. You know, in the early, in early inventories, they had me open up a spiral notebook and put lines down the middle of the pages and make columns and write it that way. And I don't know about you guys, but my head's a mess. My thinking is a mess. And writing stuff down in a spiral notebook was only marginally less messy. But being able to put my bad handwriting and messy thinking into these nice, clean little boxes actually helps me read it and make more sense out of it. Felt cleaner to me. Plus, once I had seen it laid out like this, I could remember what it looked like. We're very visual animals. Once I've seen it, I can remember that what it looks like. So next time I have a resentment or some fear, and I think, oh, I should write about it, I remember this, and I go, oh, I know what writing about it means. So, the book goes, goes on to say, well, before I do that, the reason people have such a bad time doing fourth steps is because when you hand them a piece of paper like this, they do the most natural thing in the world. They fill it out left to right, because that's the way we do things, right? But if I do that, I'm going to write down who, who I'm upset with in that first column. And I'm going to start thinking about all the stuff they did to me in the second column. And I'm going to start thinking about how it affected me in the third column. By the time I get to my part, I've re-experienced the resentment. And then I get to go to the next line and do that again, and again, and again. After four or five of those, this sucks. I don't want to do it anymore. So how we avoid that, specifically with the resentment inventory, because it's less of a problem with the others, is we work one column at a time. I always like to add to that and say the first time somebody told me to write one column at a time, I wrote names in the first column for four days and never finished the rest of the inventory because it didn't feel like I was getting anywhere. It just felt like drudgery and I wasn't getting any relief from it. So what I suggest is these sheets, four resentments, five columns, they take about 10 minutes to fill out. So if you're going to work on your fourth step for 20 minutes, I suggest that you sit down and put names in the first column on two pages. And you can go back and do the second column on those two pages, and the third, and the fourth, and the fifth. And at the end of 20 minutes, you have two finished pages of inventory. And that feels like I'm getting somewhere. I don't know about you guys, when I was in early sobriety, even still, I really like to feel like I'm getting somewhere. It's hard to do a job that never feels like it's done. But being able to look at two finished pages at the end of that 20 minutes feels like I'm making progress. It makes me want to come back and do two more pages later. And after a few days, I've run out of stuff to write about, and I can move on to step five. So, the instructions for the first column say we list people, institutions, or principles with whom we're angry. That's what's happening in that first column. I love this resentment prompt sheet because I hear that sentence, we list people, institutions, or principles, and I just hear people. And I can't even think of very many of those. But when I look at a list like this, it makes me include things that I wouldn't have thought to include. I always joke, I got halfway down this list, saw police, and went, I right, please your people? I didn't know that, because I hate them. I get, but I'm not involved with the police right at this moment, so apparently that's a resentment. Same with lawyers, same with other stuff. Also, I got down near the b bottom of the list and saw the word teachers. And I had a fourth grade teacher who picked on me until I ended up in the hospital with a bleeding ulcer. She was awful. I hadn't thought of her in 20 plus years until I read the name teachers on, the word teachers on this list. And she popped into my head. So you have to understand that the resentments I'm writing out aren't just the big giant things that are eating my lunch right this minute. It's anything in my past that when I poke it, it hurts. 
when I look at it, when I think about it for more than a second, it still causes me some discomfort. So I include it. A lot of the institutions I wouldn't have written about normally because I didn't have resentments. They were just a mess and I hated them for it. Like I had resentments against how medicine and mental health was done in this country. Some of my periods of worst addiction were the periods where I couldn't get the psych meds I needed to be okay. But, well, that's the story I told. I couldn't afford a therapist in the meds, so I spent $500 a week on drugs. It, it, it's, it's chunky math, I know, but, but by the time I was in that shape, I couldn't seem to access the things I needed. But that didn't seem like a resentment. That just felt like a statement of fact. If you're poor, you're out of luck. But see, I'm not at the doctor, and I'm, I'm agitated about it, so it's a resentment. Same thing with some of the things on the principles list. If I think about them and they annoy me, that's a resentment, I write it down. People always have questions about the first column. Can I put myself in the first column? There are varying opinions on this, here's mine. If I put me in that first box, I'm gonna spend a nice chunk of time writing what a loser I am in the second column and not learn anything. It's a great way for my disease to beat me up with my desire to do step work. See, three of these columns are about me already. So what I suggest is you do all of your other resentments first. And then you do your fear inventory and your sex inventory and the harms inventory. And if when you get to the end, there's still something about you that's bothering you, by all means, come back and add it. But do it last. Because chances are the stuff that you'll want to write about in that second column, you'll have written about in the fourth column and you'll learn more from it. I'm never going to tell an alcoholic don't do something because it's the only thing they're going to want to do from that moment forward, but just try and do it last. So people can also appear more than once in the first column. What I was taught is uh, every time you sit down to write fourth step, you say a little prayer and you invite your higher power in and you ask, you ask to be shown what it is you need to see that needs to go in that column. And if something comes to mind, you write it down. That being said, like when I first got sober, my ex didn't. And so on my first couple of four steps, she'd be on there half a dozen times because every time I sat down, she was pissing me off in a new way, scaring me basically. My father was on my first fourth step a couple of times, one for stuff he did all the time and one for a particular situation I couldn't let go of. You can organize it however you see fit. So then once I've got my first column down, I can move to the second column where the instructions say, on our grudge list, we said opposite each name are injuries. So two things are happening while I'm doing the second column. First is I'm organizing my thinking. Because I have a sense of what I'm upset with you about. One of my friends likes to say it forces my thinking to slow down to the speed of my hand. I like that. It's, it's a good mental image. Like all that chaos in my head has to slow down enough to make words. And then I get some clarity around what it really is I'm upset about. I'm also creating an outline for my fifth step. One of the things I love about this is that this little square in the second column is not big enough to write a novel in. Some of us want to write a novel. We want to write everything that that person did to us in longhand. But if I do that, this stops being an inventory, shoves me back into the resentment, and grinds the process to a halt. Now, all that stuff I want to write about, I'm going to get to talk about in step five. But in an effort to make this continue to be an inventory and not a novel, I just need to put bullet points down like the examples in the book. I'm resentful at Mr. Brown for his attention to my wife, told my wife of my mistress, might get my job. So that I know what it is I want to talk about when we get to step five on that column. Then I go to the third column says, we asked ourselves why we were angry. In most cases, we found it was our self-esteem, emotional security, pocketbook, ambitions, personal relations, including sex, which were hurt or threatened, and so we were sore. So the reason this stuff in the second column bothered me is because it threatened me in one or more of those areas in the third column. One of these areas. So I go back and I look at the second column and I ask, did the thing that they did to me threaten my self-esteem, my opinion of myself? Did it threaten my emotional security, my general sense of well-being, my pocketbook, my ambitions, and the rest? And I'm just putting check marks down as I go through the list. I just look at it and put some check marks in the third column. Now, there's something I always like to talk about at this point. 
It's not really, it doesn't really come out of the big book, but, uh, but I still believe it's true. I believe that there are three levels of spiritual existence in this life. The lowest of which is one of dependence. It's where I'm dependent on the world and things going and being a certain way for my ability to feel safe and okay. Everybody who's just getting sober is in a state of dependence. And about half of everybody running around out there without an addiction problem. Everybody's scrambling, trying to arrange the world so that they feel safe. You know, the further you get out on the spectrum, the more diametrically opposed their ideas are, but the fear is the same at both ends. And the reason I talk about that is as you're going through this and putting check marks in the third column, don't be surprised if there's not a lot of check marks. It's entirely appropriate. In early sobriety, in a state of dependence, everything feels like a threat. So I'm just putting the check marks in the third column so I can look at what was being affected. Then I can go to the fourth column and look at my part. The book says, putting out of our minds the wrongs others had done, we resolutely look for our own mistakes. That usually falls into one of two categories. How did I put myself in a position to be hurt by this person? Or once they did something wrong to me, what did I use their wrong to justify? And the first situation is like, am I hanging out with somebody who's hurt my feelings in the past and then they did it again? Because hurt me, hurt me once, shame on you. Hurt me twice, that's me. You showed me who you are and I wanted you not to be that person and that's so why I hung out with you some more and you did it to me again. You know, did I tell a bunch of private information to somebody who's less than trustworthy and they blabbed it around? But I knew that about them. But I felt like I wanted to talk. I picked a bad person to do it with. Even the Mr. Brown example in the book is a good one. Because it's very convoluted. It's perfect for us. Like, I'm resentful at Mr. Brown for his attention to my wife, telling her about my girlfriend, and trying to get my job. So what's my part? Well, I'm cheating on my wife, right? <laughs> And if you look further down the examples, I also resent my boss for threatening to fire me for being drunk at work and stealing from my expense account. So I'm a terrible employee and a terrible husband. I've created an environment where Mr. Brown can do the things he's doing. Now, what he's doing is not my fault. He's still wrong. But if I was a good husband and a good employee, he couldn't do those things as well. I've created an environment where he can hurt me. So also, then there's that, sometimes I'm just standing there and people do wrong stuff to me, especially my friends, right? But once they do it, I use their wrong to justify kind of whatever I want. You know, you hurt my feelings, I go get high. You don't hurt my feelings, I go get high. You know, you, you do something wrong to me. I'm just standing there, you do something wrong to me, and I, I kind of use it as an excuse to do anything I want. And then there's a third way things turn up in this fourth column. Because there's stuff that happens to us when we're kids, or as a result of violence or trauma that we absolutely do not have a part in. For those situations, just put an X in that fourth column. And when you put an X in the fourth column, you can't do the fifth column. But it's important to write about those things because although I didn't have a part when it happened, there's a chance that it's affecting my behavior today. I always tell a story about when I was seven, after we all went to sleep, there was a period when my dad would start yelling at my mom in the other room. He was a big guy, he was quiet most of the time, and he was letting her have it. And he was calling her honey the whole time. I don't think I was ever afraid of violence, but just the ugliness of, of the yelling really freaked me out as a little kid. In my 20s, I talked to him about it, and he told me she was managing the family money, we were really poor, and she'd wait till 8.30 at night to tell him she had messed up and they're turning the power off tomorrow. And he was furious at being put in that bad spot and ashamed for not earning better and all kind of stuff. But even having talked to my father about all that in my 20s, when I'm 37 and I'm doing the inventory, I think about it, I still feel like the seven-year-old when I think about it, so I write it down, what's my part, don't have one. And then I finish my fourth step, and I go on to do step five, and this thing keeps happening on my fifth step. I'm, I'm, ha I'm getting ready to have an altercation with somebody, an argument, an ugly exchange, an uncomfortable moment, a physical, physical violence. But before those things come to a head, I'm pulling these weird overreactions. I'm disappearing and cutting people out of my life forever, not talking to them ever again. One time I, I, I had to argue with my roommate about him not having his part of the rent, and I packed my stuff and moved out in the middle of the night. 
Other times I would walk into a room with somebody I was pretty sure we were, I was, that we were going to end up in a brawl and I would just beat them up before we were even arguing. And I looked like a crazy person. I looked unstable. And after the third one of these came up on my fifth step, my sponsor stopped and said, do you think it's possible that all this weird early overreaction is an attempt to not find yourself in a situation that made you feel the way you felt when you were seven and your dad was yelling at your mom? Made me a little sick in my stomach when he said it, because it was absolutely true. I got a button installed when I was a wee little boy, and I would rather beat you up than be in that situation. I'm less afraid of fighting you than I am yelling back and forth with you. But I'm not crazy, and I can work with that. I still work with that. Just because you realize that you have a button installed doesn't make it go away. It's still there, but I have step work I can do on that, and I can get a vision of God's will and ask him for help going and doing the thing that's scaring me and pushing that, little, that button that got installed. I didn't have a part when I was seven, but it was affecting my behavior when I was 37, and it was causing me to do things that were ineffective. And that's the only part I can change. I don't want you running around out there thinking you had a part in stuff that happened to you when, when you didn't. I didn't have a part in getting mugged and beaten up when I was 25 years old walking home drunk one night. Because I'd done it hundreds of times. Those other guys, they were just wrong, flat out wrong for doing what they did. But later, I became much more quick to violence. If something looked like it might turn physical, I, I went ahead and made sure it did so that I got to name the terms. I didn't have a part when it happened, but it affected my behavior later. And my behavior is the only part I can change. Then I go to the fifth column where it says, where had we been selfish, self-seeking, dishonest, and frightened? And on the next page, it brings in inconsiderate, unrealistic. Early inventories had this as, had looking at my part and the selfish, self-centered, seeking, dishonest, and frightened as one idea, and they would get me to do four column inventory. But the guys who taught me how to do, the, do it this way showed me there's a period in there, it's two sentences, which means it's two ideas. And it turns out that it's incredibly helpful to separate my behavior in the fourth column from the character defects that caused that behavior in the fifth column. Because those are the exact nature of my wrongs. Those are the things I need help for my higher power fixing. And there's a list floating around of like 30 something character defects. It's super neat, I, it's not helpful. It's too many, I can't remember them. This little list of six, I've never found anything in 17 plus years of doing the inventory this way that I couldn't attribute to some combination of these six. So what I'm doing in the fifth column is I'm looking at what I did in the fourth column and asking myself, were my actions selfish? Were my actions dishonest? Were they self-seeking? And selfish is I want what I want and I don't care if you don't like it. Step right on your toe, don't care. Dishonest with me or with others. Self-seeking is trickier. It's when I'm putting my needs so far ahead of everyone else's that they're not even really people to me anymore. Usually my first awareness of self-seeking is you're pissed at me and I'm not sure what I did. The best example of it that I've ever come across is I got a buddy who when he was six years sober, he had gone back to school and gotten his degree and he was married and he had a one-year-old son and he had finally gotten a good job and he decided it was time to buy a house for his family. So he looked around Austin and he couldn't really find anything he could afford in a neighborhood he wanted to live in. So then he came out and he looked around in the surrounding communities. Buda and Kyle. And he got out to Lockhart. And he found some great houses that he could afford. And he found one that he really liked. So he put an offer on the house and they accepted the offer and he bought the house. And then he went home and told his wife he bought a house. And she was pissed. And he was startled by this. And he called me. I can't believe it. Like, really, dude? It didn't occur to you to ask your wife if she wanted to move to another town? <laughs> and he was, I was trying to do what was right for my family. And I'm going, you know they get a vote on that, right? <laughs> but he, it did, that's self-seeking at an extreme. But you kind of get the idea, right? Even when I'm trying to do good, I forget that other people might have an opinion on what I'm trying to do good. And then I look at my behavior. Was it dishonest? Was it driven by fear? Was it inconsiderate? And that doesn't just mean rude, that means failing to consider. I always talk about my friend Julie. I've known Julie 25 years. She's literally never been on time to a single thing we've ever done together in 25 years. And then, you know, when we became friends, that didn't matter because I was still using it and I was never on time either. 
But once I got sober, my sponsor started holding me accountable for the rudeness that being late was. And so I started showing up on time, so it started annoying me when she didn't. And then one day, a bunch of us were going to a movie. I'm fairly certain there was a young lady I was interested in dating who was coming to the movies as part of the group, which is why I got so upset. But Julie showed up so late, the movie sold out, we couldn't go. And everybody just sort of went their separate ways. And I had to go home alone on a Friday night, and I was pissed. <laughs> so I got, I got home, I called my sponsor, and he said, you know, call me back when you've done the writing. So I did. We get to the fifth column. He said, you, you were inconsiderate. I went, how was I inconsiderate? She was late, made me miss the movie. How? And he said, think about it, buddy. He called me buddy a lot. Think about it, buddy. How long have you known this woman? And what, you know who she is. And yet you insist on setting her up for failure and making plans that she can't meet. And then you get mad at her for being who she is. Who's the inconsiderate one? God damn it, it's me. I had huge resentments against my ex-girlfriend for not being a more loving and supportive partner. But she was a crackhead and a heroin addict, just like me. I wanted stuff from her that she had never shown the ability to do. Not because she was withholding something from me, but because she was too sick to be the person I wanted her to be. So I was being inconsiderate. And I was being unrealistic. So I get to look at my behavior in the fourth column and ask myself which of these character defects were driving it, what combination. The beauty of that is once I get to the exact nature of my wrongs, then I can go into step six and ask God to help me be the opposite of those things. In that situation, I really need to get how, learn how to get to that fifth column. That's the whole point of the inventory. So I want to talk for just a minute about the third column because nobody talks about it much. We do inventory, we look at our part, we look at the character defects, but we don't talk about the third column much, and it's where the freedom happens. So as I continue to stay sober, and as I continue to do inventory, I start looking at the third column and asking myself questions like, why is my self-esteem, my opinion of me, so affected by how you treat me? Shouldn't my self-esteem be based on acting esteemably? Why is my emotional security based on running from life or trying to control it? Shouldn't my emotional security be based on a connection to God? I mean, money and pocketbook, forget it. I just close my eyes and cover my ears and hope for the best. I'm scared to death about money even if I have money. Because I'm afraid to look and see what's really happening because I'm afraid it's worse than it is. My ambitions are based on what makes me look cool or feel safe, not what God would have me be. My personal relations and sex relations over and over turn out to be based on what I can get and not what I can give. Pride's based on fooling you into thinking I'm somebody I'm not. When I come into the program, this is me in the middle. And this is everybody else in the world. And this big gray circle is my third column. And anytime anybody takes an action that comes across, it threatens me. Does that make sense? The problem is the big gray circle is supposed to be the little white one in the middle. And as I continue to stay sober, and this will take a couple of years, I stay sober and I keep doing inventory and I keep looking at that third column. I gradually begin to course correct on where, how I'm getting those needs met. And I begin to depend more and more on God's power and direction and my own actions to fill those third column needs instead of you. And that circle begins to shrink. And after a while, It'll get down to that middle circle. And I will have grown from the state of dependence that I was trapped in when I got here to the second level of spiritual existence, which is independence, where I'm depending on God's power and direction and my own actions to fill those third column needs most of the time. The beauty of that is these two guys at the top, their behavior hasn't changed at all, and they'll never bother me again. The big book says the wrongdoing of others fancied or real. It'd be nice to know the difference. Those two guys weren't a threat to me, really. They just felt like a threat because they were, I was so needy out there in the world. Now this other guy down at the bottom, he's coming up in my business where it's only safe for me and God. Setting boundaries is neat, but if you have to respect my boundary, I'm always afraid because I know I can't make you do that. It's not the boundaries not to keep you out, it's for me to know that inside here is only safe for me and God. And although I cannot control your behavior, I could take my circle and move it somewhere else. 
Because if you keep hurting me, I got to ask myself why I keep hanging out with you. What is the story I'm telling about why I got to be with you? Because it's a story and it could change. I'm not powerless over people. I decide where I stand in relationship to them. You're not powerless over people. And this allows you to have some control over that, gives you some power back. My life today exists on a continuum, and your life moving forward from today can exist on a continuum, where there are the people who I let right up next to that inside circle, because they've shown me through their behavior they're not going to hurt me all the time. There's not a lot of them, but there's some. My wife, my brother, some close friends. Then there are other people who are so sick they're not even on the screen up here. Bless their hearts, they're too sick to ever be around. But most people exist in the middle. Friends, family, co-workers. We get along fine, and then one of them starts getting spiritually unfit. And if I keep hanging out with them, I'll get spiritually unfit too. So instead, I take a step back, I give them some space, let them go figure their business out over there where they don't get it on me. When they get better, we can hang out again. And if they don't get better, at least I didn't get dragged down with them. You know, that may seem mercenary, but I, I can't afford to be pulled down by your spiritual condition. I have the power to make that choice. And so we get to do this dance. And, you know, I'm not the center of the universe. People bless my heart all the time. I have seen my friends and my wife come into a room where I am and turn around and walk right up. Heck yeah, like, I don't know what's going on with Chris. We'll come try again in a minute. You know, like, and, and that's good because if they hang out with me and I'm in a bad spot, I'm going to damage the relationship. So it's better if they're not in the room to, like, sort it out. But the more I depend on God for the third column, and the more I look at my behavior in the fourth column and the character defects in the fifth column and try and course correct so that next time this thing happens, I'm less threatened because I'm dependent on God more, and I'm be able to respond instead of just react, I get to stay at peace more and more through this process, four, five, six, and seven. But if I don't know how to do the inventory, and I'm not efficient at it, I won't have the tools that I need to be successful as life continues to grow. Knowing how to move through the columns effectively is key to getting what I'm supposed to get out of step four and step five and step six and step seven and step eight and step nine. Which means if I don't know how to do it, I can't do step 10 because it's four through nine all the time. It's like tying one hand behind your back. You might stay sober for a year or two years or five years But eventually, life is going to get so big and so demanding that unless you've got a real functional understanding of how to use this tool on a regular basis, life's going to become overwhelming, and it's going to crush you under its weight. It's why I think a lot, part of the reason I think a lot of people relapse with time is because they're not, don't have a solid functional understanding of the mechanics of the inventory process. And so they just, it's not a part of their regular recovery. There's no chance I could live the life I live without doing this on a regular basis. Now, there's also a fear inventory. It looks an awful lot like the resentment inventory. It's for fears I have with no resentment associated with them. I had lots of those, apparently. Fear of being sober. Fear I was never going to get a good job. Fear I was never going to have a real relationship. This is a way to look at my fears so I can see what's threatened in the third column. And so I can see how the fear is causing me to take ineffective action in the fourth column. And the big book says half measures avail us nothing, but where fear is concerned, half measures avail me half. They make me less afraid, but they never make me unafraid. So if I can look at my fears and get a vision of what it would look like to not have that fear and ask my higher power to help me be that person and go out and do the thing I'm afraid of, I begin to outgrow that fear. But I have to write about it. I have to look at it. I do a lot of fear inventory these days. Not a lot of resentment inventory. I don't let stuff hang around that long. But as life continues to get bigger, there's new stuff that comes up that I've never had to trust God on because it's new. You know, and uh, so I do some fear inventory and I get a vision of God's will and I go out there and try and do stuff the right way and pretty soon my comfort zone gets big enough to cover the new area too. And then my life gets bigger again. And that's just how this works. There's also a sex inventory. Guys who taught me to do this stopped at this point and said, we believe there's only two reasons to have sex. And they were old kind of country types. And I was going, oh, they're going to say something stupid. And then they said, to make babies and because it's fun. But if I'm using the act of sex 
or a relationship that involves sex or that might, that being desired by someone, for anything besides making a baby or because it's fun, I got to look at it because I'm trying to get something out of it it will never give me. We're talking about the third column again. Am I trying to get my self-esteem from this relationship? Am I trying to get my emotional security from my partner? Because they can never give me those things. So I do the inventory. Who did I hurt? Sally. What did I do? I lied and said I was interested in being her boyfriend when I really just wanted to get laid. Why did I do it? Emotional security, self-esteem. I wasn't feeling very good about me, and she was awesome. So I thought maybe if I hooked up with her, I'd be awesome too. I'm pretty sure we had a good time, but I know I got no self-esteem and emotional security out of it, and I lied. So I walked out in worse spiritual shape than I walked in. And chances are I didn't enjoy it as much as I had hoped because I knew I wasn't getting the things I was trying to get. I have to be able to look at that. We get sideways on this so fast. You know, it feels good when somebody's paying us attention. And we forget, we confuse the pleasure of that attention for the serenity of a connection to God. And we begin to pursue pleasure recklessly thinking it's happiness. And then we end up loaded or miserable or both. There's a process you can go through to go from completely insane and undateable to in a happy, long-term, sustainable relationship. But it doesn't happen in early sobriety. You have to stay sober for a bit and learn how to depend on God for that third column of stuff before you're ready to try and get into real relationships. And then you have to do a ton of this inventory every time you get sideways on how somebody's going to fix you. Because if you think you're going to find a partner that's going to complete you, that's a problem. You're already complete. You know, two people that are halfway complete don't make a whole. That's like multiplying fractions. <laughs> Two half a person makes a quarter person. That doesn't, that's, it's not better. But I do this inventory so that I can get to that place. Last inventory is a harms inventory. There's a catch-all at the end for stuff I did that I feel bad about, that there was no resentment or fear or sex associated with it. So if I do all these inventories, I have everything I need in writing for four and five and six and seven and to get started on eight. Everybody knows the phrase, the straw that broke the camel's back, right? You've heard that? Why did one straw break the camel's back? Because of all the other frickin' straw, right? I had, a, I had a, one of our alumni a while back come back from a relapse and say, you know what started my relapse? I broke a shoelace. And I, <laughs> and I couldn't take it anymore. And I looked at him and went, wow, really? And he said, yeah, last straw. I never did my fourth step. But when I do this inventory and I'm thorough, I'm taking that straw out of my pack and I'm putting it on the table and I'm getting rid of it. So when something happens tomorrow, it's not the last straw, it's a straw. And as I do the inventory and I'm running stuff through columns over and over and over, I'm actually practicing doing inventory while I'm getting rid of my past. So when something goes wrong next week, I know how to do inventory because I just did it 50 times. So the last little bit of this, and I'll let you go, is how long does it take to do a fourth step? Let's be, let's be extravagant and look at real numbers. If you wrote down 120 things, you totally won't, but if you wrote 120 resentments and fear and sex and all that, that would be 30 pages of inventory. At, at 10 minutes a page, that's 300 minutes, it's five hours. For most of you guys, 30 minutes a day for a week and you're finished. You have that time while you're here. You know, in, in week one, let your head clear. Just get used to being here. In week two, get busy on the damn step assignments. Get it done. It's a pain in the butt. It still takes about an hour. So then in week three, you can really start applying yourself to doing this fourth step. Because it's so much easier to find 20 or 30 minutes a day while you're here than when you get out. Even if your life is small, it's busier than in here. So. Show yourself you're serious in week three and this doesn't turn into adult day camp. And, and it's, because you're starting to feel a little better by week three, right? And you can spend all your time when you're not in a class hanging around outside smoking and shooting and shooting at each other. Instead of doing that, show yourself you're serious about your recovery and go spend 15 minutes a couple times a day writing one page. So that you'll be done by the time you get to the middle of the fourth week. If you get into your fourth week and you haven't found a sponsor yet, you come find me. I'll make some referrals. I want all of you to be done with this and ready to do five, six, and seven the day you get out of here.
so that you can be making amends within a week, so that you can have an intentional connection and stay sober. That's all we got. Thanks, guys. Amen.